Hi, Sonia here. Um, some of you already know me, some of you haven't met me yet and uh, I just want to introduce you all to the idea of concept training. Um, so if I give you a little bit of a, a rundown of some of the other styles of training and what we could refer to them as. So I could talk about a trainer one. Trainer one, a little bit more of the traditional type of training, certainly the school I was brought up within, which is um, essentially about dominance, essentially about being the boss. Um, this approach might use things like choke chains, um, prong collars, shock collars, uh, the idea of uh, quickly being able to teach your dog uh, to do what it is you want them to do. Sadly, although it can seem very quick and effective, uh, it's not necessarily the kindest way to go about things and in actual fact it's been shown not to be the most effective way either. Um, some of the dogs that are maybe quite anxious naturally, that kind of approach can totally make them shut down, really worried. Now it can look like they're being very good dogs but actually they're just very, very subdued and um, it's more through fear that they're a little bit worried about doing something wrong. Uh, so it can look like you've got a well-trained dog, but actually that dog's body is probably full of stress hormones. So it's not the best thing for the dog. Um, another way I refer to, uh, as do plenty of other people, as trainer two, which was the uh, upsurge in the positive reinforcement school. For sure, we use positive reinforcement, we use um, games as a reward, we use food as a reward, and we integrate that idea with our games-based approach. So there's just a lot more to it. And the downside of the positive reinforcement approach is that often it's not really real life ready. It might work in the village hall training class, a snow obedience trial, but can you always call your dog? And it always comes back when the environment is very exciting. So often it doesn't hold. The other point about um, this approach is it often uh, tells you to ignore what you don't want. Now, in actual fact, that can be very, very frustrating for your dog. Uh, they can experience some quite intense negative emotions uh, whilst going through this process of learning not to do that. So for sure, there's a much more effective way of uh, going about things. Another approach, I haven't really called that anything, which is basically when people are saying, oh, it'll be all right, oh, they'll grow out of it, this is just the puppy stage or this is the adolescent stage and it will be all right eventually. It doesn't necessarily work. Um, you know, that's just crossing your fingers and hoping really. And in actual fact, the longer your dog practices something, um, whatever it is, whether it's something you do want, but certainly if it's something you don't want, that behaviour for sure is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So if that behaviour is barking and spinning and lunging, growling, whatever it might be, uh, a behaviour that you're not wanting, for each time your dog practices that behaviour, it's going to do it again and again and again. It's going to be the dog's go-to behaviour. Um, so, you know, we're wanting to make sure that doesn't really happen. Um, so, with our trainer three approach, we're looking at digging deep and we're looking at focusing on the emotions that are motivating or driving the behaviour. So the other approaches basically are looking at the behaviour and thinking about, you know, how we might get a sit or something or, or, or as I say, it could be the recall. Um, and they're doing things to, to try and directly change that behaviour. The problem is, if we don't look at what the emotions are that are driving the behaviour, often it's not going to be real life ready. It's not going to always hold. Um, so uh, the, the trainer three, we're looking at the idea of digging deep, finding out where the dog is struggling. 
we're looking at each individual dog. It's very much train the dog in front of you and relying on the feedback from the dog to tell us, you know, how we can move forward. And we're talking about concepts. Now, this might be the concept of frustration, your dog feeling frustration, that emotion of frustration. It might be that we're talking about a dog being pessimistic. This might sound a bit strange when applied to a dog, but be sure that the science has shown us that, yeah, dogs have a bias towards pessimism or optimism, as do any of the animals. Some are just more optimistic than others. So they've done lots of cognitive bias tests to show, you know, whether a dog is naturally pessimistic, you know, starts off with that personality. Um, we've got other concepts that we, we look at um, and what we're wanting to do is to help change or shape the dog's brain, to make it easy for the dog to be able to do the behaviour we do want. For sure, if we've got a calm, optimistic dog that can deal with frustration, um, that's a dog that's going to find it much easier to fit into our complicated human world. Um, so we then play games that are specifically designed to help shape your dog's brain. So in other words, to create more optimism, to create the ability for the dog to deal with frustration, to create a dog that, where, that can get excited but still be able to think. Because for sure, most dogs, owners get frustrated, they know the dog knows the recall, they know the dog knows how to go loose lead walking, uh, but it all falls apart, you know, out in the real world. Um, people can get quite cross about things, frustrated, embarrassed, and um, think that there's something wrong with the dog. Um, it isn't that, the dog is struggling. The dog is stressed, the dog's anxious, frustrated, whatever it might be. So this approach digs deep, gets to the root cause. So it's not just putting a plaster on and then something, the behavior comes out in a different way. Um, for example, with the trainer one, if you're correcting a dog for growling, you know, when you stop the dog growling by punishing the growl, well, the experience, the emotion is still being experienced. And if the dog thinks, oh, I'm not allowed to growl, next stage might be a bite. So there are things you have to be very aware of that were far better to find out the root cause. Where is the dog struggling and how can we help our dog? So the idea is that we can create a dog that is much more comfortable, feels safe, calm and happy in our human world and is able to deal with the challenges and um, that even something as simple we might think as an ordinary walk, there's a lot of challenges in our environment to our dogs because uh, their physiology, their nature is far removed really from our, what we're wanting from our domestic dogs. Um, so we have produced a book, Lexi and I, it's called Deviant to Dream Dog. Deviant was a little bit tongue in cheek um, and we go through four principles within the book. Uh, so we start off with the dog end of the lead where we're looking at the needs and the drives of our dogs, the nature of our dog. There's a human end of the lead for sure. We affect how our dogs uh, are coping, our emotions, our frustrations do spill over and affect our training sessions and our day-to-day -day living. Uh, there's a section on the powerful partnership, which is when we're focusing on the games. They're only very short, three minute maximum, probably 30 second games. Uh, you can play three games um, even within a minute. So it's short and sweet for the games. It's great fun. The dog learns very, very quickly. And um, so that's to boost your partnership to make it that the dog chooses to be with you rather than chasing off after the rabbit. Also, it's how we can encourage our dogs to be more optimistic, deal with frustration, some of those concepts that uh, we spoke about before. And the last part is managing the environment. And that's basically how we can set 
things are up for our dog to succeed so they're not practicing the things we don't want them to practice because for each time that dog does the behavior that we don't want it becomes their go-to behavior so we look at ways in which we can manage the environment to set our dog up for success whilst we're working on the games uh, we're being aware of the feedback from the dog looking at the body language thinking about our body language and we put all those four things together to move forward to work towards that perfect partnership so we get real life results there is um, science behind all of this so we're looking at the most up-to-date scientific research but there's also an art to it the art is perhaps the hardest part because that's when we're really thinking about uh, looking at the honest feedback that the dog's giving us so that we can adjust second by second to make sure we're training the dog that's in front of us at that moment. So looking forward um, to meeting you and your dogs and hopefully we can move things forward. Thanks now.